production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland, where we are devoted to conversations of consequence that help democracy thrive. I'm Brittany O'Connor, Vice President of Public Affairs at Citizens, and a proud member of the City Club and the League of Women Voters, and the City of Lakewood, where so many of my friends are here from. I'm proud that my company, Citizens, is partnering with the City Club on our forum today. It's part of the City Club's Local Heroes series. The series is designed to ensure that champions living and working here in Northeast Ohio have a leading role in our continuing community dialogue. The speakers represent a cross-section of the brightest thinkers and doers whose hard work changes the way we view ourselves and the community. It is my privilege to be a part of this today to introduce Erica Anthony. Erica is the co-founder of Cleveland Votes and in 2019 became the executive director of the Ohio Transformation Fund, a philanthropic organization that advocates for healthy communities and an equitable democracy across Ohio. You may have also seen the news from just a few days ago. Erica was appointed as one of six co-chairs to mayor-elect Justin Bibbs' transition team, an appointment that will... <laughs> An appointment that will surely benefit all of Cleveland as Erica has been at the forefront of civic engagement in Northeast Ohio for years. Her recent work centers around developing relationships with trusted stakeholders that are most proximate to historically disenfranchised residents and grounding those relationships in the realities of our social fabric. This is a very relevant and critical conversation in Cleveland right now. In September 2021, Cleveland's primary election saw voter turnout increase from 2017 numbers, but still ran below a 20% turnout. The similarly low turnout from the November 2nd election has understandably sparked more debate over the civic health of Cleveland. While some of the election-related data may lead us to question whether Cleveland voters are apathetic, research suggests that's emph emphatically not the case. In fact, they care deeply about their community and believe that collective power needs to be amplified and equitably distributed to affect change. So what exactly is needed in this moment? How might we all reimagine the future of equitable civic engagement and democracy building? And how might we collectively work towards increasing voter engagement in future elections and beyond? To answer this today, guests, members, and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Erica Anthony. I feel like I'm at the family reunion. I'm the cool auntie y'all all came to see. Oh my gosh. Some of you I have not even seen in living color since before the pandemic and my heart, my heart is full right now. Y'all got me crying, I didn't even say a word. My heart is full. There are people here who have been with me through so many, so many journeys in my life. There are family members and friends across this country that I know are tuning in right now. I stand here on the backs of my ancestors. I do not stand here alone, and we cannot fix democracy alone. So let's start there. I am humbly honored to be before you all this afternoon. Thank you, Dan, for the invitation. Thank you all for taking time in, in what is still a very precarious time. So I know there are safety risk in coming out. Um, and I thank you for joining us all this afternoon. It's been a little bit of a whirlwind of a week, uh, as you just heard. Uh, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But there's also been a lot of celebration. Um, I see Mr. Abbott here um, from the George Gunn Foundation. So there's joy in democracy and so much to celebrate, despite what the data may say. Before we start, I'm gonna ask for a request that may be a little unconventional. Sorry, Dan and Cynthia, I didn't run this by you. But I'm gonna ask you all to set an intention for our time together today. I'm gonna to ask you to pause. You can close your eyes, you can just gaze. If you're tuning in virtually, you can do the same. 
This intention can be for yourself, it could be for your family, it could be for your neighborhood, it could be for really anything you want to center our conversation around. And I'm gonna pause and just ask you to send that intention right now. So normally I will, I hold my intentions sacred to my heart. They're my private thoughts, my private time. But today I will share with you, coming in here this afternoon, I set an intention of healing and restoration. There is a lot of pain and grief that many members of our community are facing right now. And if we do not center on the person, the whole person, then we can't expect to move past and figure out how to solve democracy. So I invite you today to bring forth your intention. I receive your energy. I hope you receive my energy and know that together our collective power can really do anything. That's the truth. Most days uh, are pretty overwhelming when you are in this work of democracy building, organizing, activating on so many issues. I, I look around this room and I see friends who are working in the environmental space. I see those that are down at the State House fighting for our democracy and so many others. Comrades here who are addressing issues in our jails and prisons. These issues are overwhelming, y'all. And they're personal for many of us. This is not a job. It's not a vocation. It is literally our livelihood. The ability to wake up and have motivation to have hope is really hard some days, which is why my family, my husband, my village, 99% of them that are sitting in here right now are what keep me motivated. These moments also call for a tremendous amount of grace. We don't know what people are contending with. I can't say I know what your personal experience is, and I should not, and I, I try not to pass judgment, but hope and pray that you know whatever that interaction was that maybe wasn't positive, there wasn't malice behind that, but that someone may be dealing with something far beyond what I can comprehend, so I try to extend grace. I hope that others will extend grace to me as well. Before I can really dig into what does it take to reimagine a more equitable democracy, I think it's important to ground this conversation in who I am. Where did I come from? I'm just a girl from Long Island who chose to be in Cleveland 16 years ago. Well, maybe not exactly chose. Um, I came here via my sister and brother-in-law who made a relocation journey for their work and asked me to join them. And if I'm being honest, I sort of looked at them sideways and like, I'm living my best life in Brooklyn. <laughs> I'm loving life, like what's good? Why, why, why y'all want me to come to Cleveland? Um, but they, you know, for a multitude of reasons, personal and, and really to support my family, I decided to take this journey really with the intention of being here for a couple of months to help my family get settled in and support them and my nephews. Um, but what I often have said is that Cleveland courted me, we dated, <laughs> we got engaged, <laughs> and now we're in this long-term relationship. Uh, I just celebrated 16 years in Cleveland this summer, and I am so grateful for the opportunities that have been afforded to me in my time here. We are born and bred New Yorkers, really no footprint in the Midwest, so we came here on blind faith. Moving to a city as an adult and not really knowing anyone or having a, a natural network can be quite intimidating. I learned how to spend time by myself, I learned the value of just exploring and really getting to know a new city through the eyes of someone that really had never spent time here. It's also really important to note who my family is. My parents are literally my bedrock. My dad in the heaven form, my mom in the physical form. There is really nothing that I do or believe in that was not shaped by my, pa my family, my parents, my siblings, and others. Their sacrifice has allowed me to stand here today, and I'm forever grateful. They were very active, and as I reflect back, more often than not, I probably didn't even really understand what they were doing as a child, whether they were involved in a civic association or at the school, involved in parent-teacher you know, parent associations. 
supporting candidates, you know, I probably didn't fully comprehend at the time, but that exposure, even if it wasn't realized and processed in the moment, really was foundational to who I am today. Accompanying them to the ballot, seeing them vote, seeing how important this was. The conversations I have with my mom, who just yesterday celebrated her 76th birthday. Yes, shout out to mom. Are a gift, and I cherish them probably more as she gets older in understanding what she has seen in her lifetime. And she literally says, we were on FaceTime with her last night to me and my husband, never did I think my babies would be experiencing what I and your dad experienced 20, 30 plus years ago. And she's like, and it hurts my heart that we are still facing issues in our community that your dad, your grandparents, other elders in our family have been fighting for. But at the same time, she says she's so proud and so grateful to have children and grandchildren who are out here fighting every single day. They are my foundation. They are the bedrock and they are who center me to stay focused about who I am and where I need to go and how I need to show up. Very early on, my mom and dad would say to me, the janitor and the CEO both put their pants on the same way. You give each person respect. I don't care where you are, who you're with, you bestow respect upon individuals as humans, not as titles. We're not superheroes. None of us are superheroes. Not one human being can overcome or address an issue, right? Which is why seeing this room filled with so many partners that I have the honor to work with on a daily basis. We brainstorm, we strategize, we cry, we curse, <laughs> we do a whole bunch of things to try to get ourselves through, but it's through that power of a collective that allows us to push through. Y'all know I'm not even reading my notes, I'm just <laughs> free flowing. Um, but I think another foundational thing to talk about, um, and it's sort of a silly example, but um, I think it's, it's funny to share from my experience in high school. So back in the 1900s, because apparently, I'm looking at the young folk in the room, Apparently that's how we're referring to the 1900s, as if I was churning butter or something. <laughs> I don't really quite understand, but don't feel that old. Um, but back in the 1900s, <laughs> I actually have a girlfriend who her, her child was asking her, they're like, mommy, like, how are you? Or when's your birthday? And she's like, such and such date. She's like, no, but like, what year were you born? And she says 19, da 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 da. And she's like, mommy, <laughs> like, you were born in the 1900s. <laughs> Um, so back in the 1900s, when I was in high school, um, I went, for high school, I went to an all-girl, pretty affluent Catholic school. And this is an important detail, because the town that I grew up in, Long Island, uh, at the time, was predominantly black. And my parents made the hard decision to transfer me to a private school for better educational opportunities. My siblings, who are 9 and 11 years older than me, both had gone through our public schools, so it's not that my parents were not in support of public school, but by the time I got to junior high school, our school district was really declining pretty horribly. And administrators actually told my parents, get her out. Like, if you want her to have the quality education that her siblings received, she has to go. We didn't have that many options available as far as where I can get to by bus, so they didn't tell me when we went to tour the school <laughs> that it was an all-girl Catholic school. But nevertheless, uh, there's a longer version of this story that I can share afterwards. But you know, I was pretty upset because I was comfortable in my neighborhood. I was comfortable with my friends. And I really, at that time, didn't understand what quality education meant, right? Because I was 13 years old. <laughs> I wanted to kick it with my friends. Um, but I'm grateful that they made that investment. Um, in my senior year, I decided to run for president of the school. So it was a K through 12 school. Um, the high school level, you would have your each respective class um, student council, but then there was like an executive team. So I ran for office and uh, votes come in and I win. So I'm super hyped, me and my girlfriends yelling, screaming. Well, my opponent was not as happy because she lost. So she demanded a recount. Okay, cool. So we do a recount. Comes back, Erica, my maiden name, Ford, won. She is sobbing. She's in the office, like she just can't believe this, um, and demands another recount. And I'm like, 
well, this is like, girl, it ain't that serious, <laughs> right? Like, this is a high school student council election. So because it's the 1900s, I call my mom on a payphone, and I'm like, hey, mom, <laughs> I think you need to come up to the school because things are, things are looking not so good for this election. Um, and long story short, after three uh, recounts, uh, and she finally resolved to the fact that I had won the seat. And it's, it's important to note this because, you know, this is not as significant as, like, the Bush Gore recount, right? <laughs> it's not that serious. But it was the first time that I observed the way in which somebody could contort reality, despite what facts were showing, right? And I'm like, well, this was the process. We followed the process, right? Logic says if A plus B equals C, then that's it. And in this particular moment, the thing that stood out the most to me was she looked at me and said, you don't deserve this. Well, girl, why? I've been here since kindergarten. This is my seat. I said, you are owed nothing. You have to work for it. And I started to understand at this young age, right, that people can have their own form of reality and that there is a, a, a spirit of thinking that you are owed something. And that is not the case. And that has not been the case for me. And that spirit stays with me. We are Facebook friends. I mean, she looks like she's having a good time in life and stuff, but um, <laughs> her kids are cute and all, but you know, I won't say her name out loud. So jumping back to current times and to really hone in on where our time is or where our time will be for today, I think we need to acknowledge that we need a serious transformation when it comes to democracy. You heard Brittany share some of the statistics as it relate to our primary and our most recent election. And while our time today for sure will not allow us to fully digest and dissect all that we need to talk about when it comes to democracy, I hope we can remember the intentions that we all set, set at the beginning of our time together and really think about how we can collectively invest our time to think about how to solve these issues. It's important to note that I don't have the solution. So sorry, I hope the food is what drew you here today. <laughs> I do not have the answer to democracy. Um, and like my friends to my right, Third Space Action Lab, we also don't have the 10 steps to eradicating racism. But what we do have is a spirit of conviction and tenacity to invest our gifts toward a more liberated future. And if we can center our intention and our thoughts around that, then I think we can solve anything. Part of what we need to think about deeply is about power. Who has it? Who's willing to relinquish it? Who's willing to share it? And how do we begin to shift power? I don't believe anyone is actually powerless. There may be situations that you may feel powerless, but that does not consume who you are as a human being. Each of us hold power. Each of us hold gifts and assets some of them are not always realized right away, right? Sometimes someone will wake up in their 50s and say, oh my gosh, this is what I want to do. This is how I want to give to the world. And that's OK. There's no timetable on thinking about how do you contribute, how do you bring your gifts forward. But it's the power of we and how we think about power that really is at the center of democracy. I mean, the reality is, as I stand here before you all today, when the Founding Fathers were drafting these documents, I did not count. I wasn't even a whole human being. So that was an experiment. And I think we have to acknowledge that, that for the last couple of centuries, we've been experimenting and trying to figure out how to realize democracy. So if we set our mind to understand that this is an experiment and that we have to prototype and try some things and that trying those things may result in things not being successful, we have to be OK with that. Every day, the Cleveland Votes team, advocates and activists across the state that I work with through Ohio Transformation Fund, and 99% of the people in this room that I work with, literally all we're doing is experimenting. <laughs> we are prototyping and trying to figure out how to move closer to that liberated future that we all desperately would like to have. And in the nonprofit sector, failure is not celebrated. If I was in Silicon Valley, and venture capitalists and multimillionaires were investing in some new tech thing that would make my phone better or my Apple Watch better, and I failed, it would be celebrated. So why do we have this notion for those that are trying to address systemic challenges 
that we should just figure it out. Evelyn said years ago, and it has stayed with me, we think that we can solve systemic challenge in a programmatic cycle. <laughs> How? How, right? So we have to think deeply, and we have to celebrate that something that's unsuccessful does not mean it's a failure, because the spirit of conviction and tenacity allowed that person to even have the thought to say, I'm going to try this, or I'm going to try that. When the pandemic hit last year, and we were you know, coming into 2020, feeling ourselves like we got a presidential election, we have the census, we have our best laid plans, right? And then slap, right? For all of us, right? On a personal level, a professional level, we were forced to, in real time, figure out how are we gonna get to the people? I see my girlfriend, Selena here from Young Latino Network. She brought a tradition from the, from the mainland of Puerto Rico called Caravana. Never heard of it. Jen from the team was like, we're gonna do this thing called Caravana. I was like, cool, okay, just let me know where to show up. And in the midst of this pandemic, when safety was of, of utmost concern, our health was of utmost concern, they innovated and figured out that if we get in our cars, right, then we're physically distanced, we can figure out how we can get voter registration, vote by mail to individuals in our community. Because oh, by the way, we went from having no in-person election to having a virtual, an entire, excuse me, absentee vote by mail application. How many of y'all typically vote in person either early or at your polling location? Exactly. Now trying to figure out in the middle of March going into April how we try to not only educate the masses that this change has happened, but also help them get access and gain access to vote by mail information as well as the applications. You're like, oh, Erica, that's simple. They can just print it out from home. I don't know about y'all, but I just got a printer in my house <laughs> about a year ago, okay? Like, sorry, other employers, but I printed my stuff at work, right? That's what I did. I didn't have a printer at home, but now we expect that everyone's going to have a printer at home, right? And they're going to be able to print out these applications and submit them to the Board of Election or the Secretary of State. Even if someone had access to do that, we have to also contend with the fact that digital redlining is a real thing in this city. I don't see her here specifically today, but um, Sue, Sue Dean uh, from Mobilize the Vote came to us earlier this year. She and a number of volunteers were doing some outreach work, uh, primarily in Ward 5 uh, with the public housing units there um, in the central, central neighborhood. And they were having issues with connectivity. So they were coming to us asking for hotspots. So they were there. They were trying to do the work. They were trying to engage with voters. But they literally could not connect to the internet. right? So when we think about these barriers and we think about these challenges, we have to ground ourselves in understanding people are not making choices to not be engaged. There are physical barriers that are reducing the likelihood that they can get there. And there, and there are many more. So coming back to power, I think it's really important to understand that we should be aspiring to move to a term that we use a lot um, at Cleveland Votes called new power. There was a book, we tend to read books together because I'm a geek, so then the team is a geek. Um, <laughs> but we read this book, um, I think in 2019 actually, called New Power. And I'm gonna share just a snippet because I think it's really important to, to this conversation today. Um, the authors, they talked about that power is a current. Um, and what we want to have in the new power form is that it's open, participatory, and peer-driven. We upload and then we distribute out. We're not holding on tight to whatever that thing is that we have. Like water or electricity, it is the most powerful, forceful surge that we can see. The goal with new power is to not hoard it, but to channel it back out. Old power, on the other hand, is like currency. It's held by few. Once gained, it's jealously guarded. And the power has substantial, has the power to substantially store rather than expend back out. It's closed, it's inaccessible, and it's leader driven. It downloads and it captures. It's important to understand that, again, each of us do in fact hold power. And it's a question of how do we share that power? How do we share our gifts with each other? Brittany referenced uh, briefly, um, and Dan Daniel here from Policy Matters knows that 
we spent a lot of time in this research that we did um, thanks to the investment from the George Gunn Foundation, saying hello to my gun people, um, along with policy matters and hit strategies. And a lot of what the conclusions say are really centered on the power of the collective. What we're doing here is a great example of that. We need to foster spaces where we can have dialogue and discussion and really hone in on what does it mean to be in community with one another and not just think about the transaction or the act of voting, but what does it mean to be in community? So I'll just note just a few. There's many, many findings from this research. But one of the first things that we, we heard is that the participants uh, are concerned about the state of their communities. They care deeply about improving them. But the reality is they don't trust local elected officials to enact the change they wish to see. There was an overwhelming majority of high, high potential infrequent voters that talked about issues related to healthcare, public safety, improving K through 12, uh, education, and many other issues that are of most importance to them. I'm going to read one quote from a Latina woman that participated in our focus group. Quote, but I feel I haven't seen any big changes in a long time. As far as our, our Cleveland government, the city police, the correction officers in the country, all, that, all this stuff is going down. The clerk, as far as I like, excuse me, the clerk, as far as I know, I don't know what they're called, but there's a lot of corruption. Different offices in our state, in our, in our communities, are using funds inappropriately. I just don't understand how we can affect change and where I fit into this picture. Voters are also not apathetic. And I think that is a big message that we need to shift globally and understand how we other people as we talk about them. If someone tells me I'm apathetic, am I going to be encouraged <laughs> to be like, yeah, sign me up, right? <laughs> like, let's do it. So we have to be really careful of labels and the ways in which we talk about individuals in our community because it can be extremely dehumanizing. So this power of the collective is really where we have to center ourselves and understand how do we move beyond the ballot. You can read the, for the research in detail, and we're happy to share that with you. And I think some of you would, would walk away from reading that like, dang, <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. And we do. But at the same time, it's an invitation to say, OK, we have this information. How are we going to address it? And we need to challenge ourselves to think about what are we doing in between our, election, our elections, right? Daniel mentioned a few examples, and I'll offer a few more. Right now, there are many ways that folks can plug in, whether it is through the participatory budgeting effort for our ARPA dollars. Clevelanders for Public Comment have been on fire this year and, and have availed us the opportunity to have public comment at our city hall for the first time in over 100 years. There are countless examples. And I think it's really important to also understand that I know that I have a, what I consider a privileged view into our community. And I'm very protective of my comrades and the folks in our community because I see the grit. I see how hard they are working. And when people make negative comments about, oh, Clevelanders don't care, voters don't care, it's like a shot in the heart. Because I see every day beyond election day how hard. I see Molly here who works diligently uh, with homeless and houseless um, individuals in our community. So many examples of folks who are pushing really, really hard. We know that the barriers are real, some of them structural, some of them informational. We can go on and on and talk about the ways dis and misinformation uh, are coming to us, the voting purges, lack of transportation. The list is countless. But instead of focusing on those structural barriers, which we do, and all voting locals are going to figure it all out, we need to also think about you know, what do we really want to think about, and how do we want to evaluate the civic health, as Brittany said in her opening remarks, of our democracy? How do we move beyond and push beyond just simply looking at voter turnout? For me, the health of our community, the health of our democracy, should be evaluated on whether or not members of our community are thriving. Are they accessing safe and affordable housing? Are they breathing in clean air? Do they have access to green space and beautiful tree canopies, a term I didn't even know existed a couple of years ago. Shout out to my placemaking folks. Are they living in, in a state of safety and not fear of law enforcement? Are they saddled or relieved of student debt? 
are we really being clear and, and clear and understanding how we continue to enslave people in our jails and our prisons simply because they cannot post bail? Do members of our community have access to quality health care or mental health services? The list can go on and on. This is how we evaluate democracy, y'all. It's not just by looking at this ward, that ward, this turnout, that turnout. We need to broaden the definition, we need to broaden the understanding to really think about the multi-sectional, multi-dimensional uh, and intersectional nature of what democracy is. There are folks here probably representing almost every sector that is working diligently every day to make Cleveland a better place. And as our mayor elect said, we can't wait. We can't wait. The problems are urgent, but we have to be intentional and we have to be diligent, and we have to understand that at the center of all of this are human beings. We can look at a dot on a graph or a chart and say, oh, this means this or this means that, and those that know me know I love data. So this is no shade <laughs> to the research and the data because it's really important, but there are layers to this, and we have to understand the complexity and what this actually means. So again, there are so many examples of where I see positive change in our community, and I'm looking at our time, so I know we're getting close, um, and maybe I can share some of them uh, while we're having questions and answer, but I'll conclude by saying this and returning to my intention. What I seek for our community, for you all, is for us to commit to healing, restoring, and thriving together. Let's commit to a new social contract that faces racism and it's race, the racist policies that continue to saddle us and hold us back. Let's commit to fostering our community's civic health and mutual trust. Let's commit to a restorative economy that embraces cooperation instead of competition, inclusion instead of exclusion, abundance instead of scarcity. And lastly, let's recommit to reimagining the power of democracy beyond and in between elections. Thank you. Again, I'm Dan Malthrop. Uh, today at the City Club, we're listening to a forum in our local hero series featuring Erica Anthony. She's co-founder of Cleveland Votes and executive director of the Ohio Transformation Fund. She's also a student body president from the 1900s. <laughs> um, we're about to begin the Q&A. And, and by the way, for the radio audience, that was a standing ovation. Um, you should know that. Um, we're about to begin the audience Q&A, and we welcome questions from everyone, including guests, City Club members, and, and students as well, as well as those of you joining us via the live stream or on the radio on 90.3 IdeaStream Public Media. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and we'll work it into the program. And if you would not on Twitter and you'd like to get a question in otherwise, you can text your question to 330-541-5794. The number again is 330-541-5794. We will work those questions into the program. We've got member volunteers on the microphones today, including City Club Debate Committee Co-Chair Will Tarter and City Club member Sarah Giorgi. And uh, may we have our first question, please? I spoke to you in the beginning about uh, working with immigrants. I just wanted to know, is uh, it your perception that they are some of the most eagerest people to vote once they obtain their citizenship? It's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I could quantify or qualify an entire group of individuals um, in that way, because I think it's, it's a very personal individual experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, people are not a monolith. So I, it was hard for me to answer that question, but I think there is great joy and excitement. Um, I saw Dante. Um, last summer, uh, Third Space, NACP Cleveland, All Voting is Local, we did a series called Biscuits and Democracy, um, along with uh, the Roaming Biscuits, help me out, Ev. Rowing Biscuits, okay, Shonda. Um, and it was an amazing series where we brought together some really good biscuits, um, some really good food, uh, DJ, and just really a way to register people to vote 
um, have them take the census if they wanted to do that. We had laptops available. And I remember one of um, Dante's mentees uh, had registered to vote for the first time. And that's a very vivid experience, I remember, where there was just such joy and excitement. Um, so I think there's many instances of joy and excitement, um, but I wouldn't say that there's you know one group of individuals that have that more than another. Good afternoon, Erica. Hi, Chris. Hi. Um, you are now part of a generational shift in power in Cleveland. I wonder what, <laughs> yes, <laughs> what will be the early signs that the power is being exercised differently that you will be looking for? Yeah. Well, first, I think we have to go back to this entire year. Um, the shift started through the ways in which this campaign, in this case that you're referring to our mayor-elect, um, as well as many organizers and volunteers on the ground, um, both for the mayoral campaign of mayor-elect Bibb, as well as me just holding up issue 24 um, as another set of uh, great advocates in our city who worked diligently to get that issue passed. I think understanding, again, what I said before about being participatory and engaging, um, I think both mayor-elect Bibb's campaign as well as the Issue 24 campaign, one, uh, embraced and understood the importance of those most proximate to these issues. Shout out to Brian Stevenson, one of my best friends. Um, not really, <laughs> but if you're listening, Brian, we should be best friends. Um, you know, they did some of the old school, right? Just door knocking, meet and greets in the community, um, but also embraced the evolution of where we're going around relational organizing through texting and phone banking. Um, but it's really important to understand that, again, the culmination is more than the decision that was made, right, last week. Um, so for me, I'm really excited, one, to see the, the continuous follow through and what I saw in this particular campaign translate into our city hall and really understand what, it, what does it mean to reimagine a city hall that is uh, perhaps evolving to be more participatory and really inviting the community to come in and be a part of the making of our city. Thank you. I thought they were going to alternate, so I had to wait a little. My, my question deals with what are we going to do to get more civility in our democracy, in our public speech? Uh, basically get rid of the hate words, demonizing people by, I'm good, you're terrible. How do we get civility back into democracy and in our public arena? For Thank sure. you. You're welcome, sir. Thank you. I mean, first, I think it's really understanding how to foster more spaces like this. Um, there's a, a wonderful woman in our community, Ms. Gwen Garth, um, who I was talking to a few months ago about how to create civic cafes, right? And I think because we're still contending with and figuring out COVID, um, we're not sure if and when that will come to fruition. But we need more spaces to have dialogue. Um, going back to what my observations and recollections are from my parents, you know, the kitchen table conversations, you know, going to such and such, you know, so-and-so's house and having conversation in a way that's not polarizing, but really listening, right? And I think it's important to understand the power of listening. My husband is in education and is currently at a school where he's leading work around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And every night we have very interesting dialogues <laughs> about our day. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges that I, I'm observing in some of, the, some of the issues that he's experiencing is individuals' lack of ability to listen, right? Um, and really understand that we can hold different opinions but still share space. But we have to do that in a way that's respectful. So I don't know how we shift the entire culture to not be so dehumani dehumanizing, but I think it starts with really starting to listen to our community members and understand their concerns. Um, again, referencing issue 24 as an example, um, what we witnessed in the last couple of weeks leading up to the election and the fear mongering that came along with the ways in which some individuals were talking about what this issue was seeking to do um, was really hurtful. And I know it was really hurtful for many of those working on the campaign, volunteering their time, um, but pleasantly hearing from some of the organizers, you know, the conversations that they were having individually, door to door or in different meet and greets were more positive. So I think that gives me hope and inspiration. Hey, 
Hey. What's up? Um, so, uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Selena Pagan. I'm the executive director of the Latino Network. And coming from one of those organizations that's boost on the ground that's doing this work, can you talk to us a little bit about the investment from our philanthropic partners that really need to be made into the folks doing this work, right? I know there's a lot of challenges with organizations that are grassroots, right, and they're movement building that have not been set up for success, right, have not been invested in to build that capacity. What does that look like moving forward to achieve that equitable democracy? For sure. Well, I think, you know, first I just have to shout out um, the Cleveland Votes team, Jennifer Devante and China, um, and our co-founder, Crystal Bryant. You know, a few years ago when we started this organization, from its core and from its inception, reinvesting in organizations was core, in her core to who, who we are and how we do our work. Um, thanks to increased fundraising um, and investments that we've received, we've been able to do much more than we did when we first started. Um, so again, thinking about shifting power, we have to think about this long term, right? And I think as 501c3s, we have limitations um, from, a, from a legal standpoint as far as like how we receive money and what we can do. But again, going back to this being an experiment, we have to really think thoughtfully uh, about what are different ways to generate revenue that maybe we have not explored. That also requires investing in leaders. Um, Selena being one of those that, you know, every once in a while I pick up the phone like, hey girl, hey. Um, not for anything in particular, but she is a young, beautiful leader in our community that, you know, I have the honor to work with and also needs to have cover and support around her. So beyond the operations of what we do on a daily basis, there also has to be investment in the leadership in understanding what does long-term investment, multi-year investment look like. Um, you know, this may be, I'm gonna say it. We have foundations locally uh, that have a lot of trepidation, right? And I think, uh, not to pick on my friends at Gun, I think they can push and agitate their colleagues even more to understand why this is inherent in their work. We can't just have the Gun Foundation be the primary foundation that is investing in democracy building. And we need to really agitate and think about how, again, does democracy show up in the environment work, in affordable housing, in placemaking? All of it is baked into democracy building and really the, work, the, the wealth needs to be distributed, not just in the form of elections, but really thinking about if you are leading an arts program, how does democracy show up? If you are leading a program around mutual aid and cooperative living and thinking, how does democracy show up? So it's really a shift, I think, in understanding that it's not just this niche specific box that we have to fit everything into, but really how does it carry through the entire fabric, literally, of everything we do and what we're striving for? Good afternoon. Uh, I admit it. I'm a boomer, uh, definitely born in the 1900s. Uh, <clears throat> there is no question that today Cleveland is transforming. The city itself, just on uh, CPN this morning, the list of the changes uh, in leadership in Cleveland that have occurred. You have mentioned um, a number of organizations. I, I have tried to be attentive and active in Cleveland, but most of them were new to me. Um, so here's my question. Um, we have seen in this election, uh, this last election for mayor, that there have been a lot of young people that really have gotten excited and involved. But how do they, and even I, best know how to be involved and to contribute? Yeah. It seems maybe there's a, a project a foundation could sponsor um, uh, to put a compendium together of all of the different organizations and how to get involved. Does one exist? Do you have one, and what are your suggestions? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, Jen from the Cleveland Votes team and I talk about this often. You know, when you turn 18, there's no like, welcome to adulthood, welcome to you know, how to be an engaged citizen, right? We don't receive a letter in the mail or anything like that. There are many traditions, whether we're talking about bat mitzvahs or quinceaneras, right? Like, that are like a passing of you becoming an adult um, that are very ceremonial. Surprisingly, we don't have that when it comes to civic engagement. So I agree 100%, this is part of our challenge, right? There's not a doorway, right, to, to really funnel individuals through to say, go here or come here. Um, you know, of course, we have our, our county uh, board of elections, um, but going back to the research, right, individuals, you know, sometimes don't have trust in our local elected officials and our government. And I think that's just a reality we have to accept, which is why we work so closely with our board of elections as well as our secretary of state 
because I think in many ways we can serve as a, a buffer, right, for, for people to understand that we're essentially translating the same information that these entities are putting out, but we are a trusted messenger and we're a trusted partner and it's received differently. So one, yes, uh, we did produce a toolkit last year called Commit to CLE for this reason exactly, um, because we were, literally being inundated <laughs> with so many organizations, so many individuals, you know, I think with everything that was happening in 2020 between the pandemic, the, the horrific murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, people were having awakenings and I welcome that and I'm grateful for that, but trying to find an easy path, right, to just like plug people in, um, this work is very personal and I think it's really important that there isn't one way to plug in and we have to honor the different ways that make sense for people. So when people ask, we said, you know, do you want to do in person or, or virtual? You know, do you have a particular part of the city that you're comfortable in? You know, do you have a bike? Do you have, you know, modes of transportation? This work uh, really requires a, a customized understanding that there isn't one way to exercise your democracy or there's not one way to plug in. So yes, we do have a toolkit um, and of course all of this can be amplified more and I think that was the other message that we received from this research is that we need to do more to amplify the resources that do exist. But it is overwhelming um, and it can be really hard but I'm happy to share that toolkit with you. Yes, I want to hear from the young folk. Hi. <laughs> Who are um, not born in the 1900s. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Aiden Dever. I'm a senior from Lakewood High School. And so kind of bouncing off the previous question, I'm wondering what um, like we as students and like more kids who are under the age of 18 who can't quite vote yet, what steps can we take to like kind of do that like making democracy like better and like, you know, doing what we can compared to like leaving everything to the older generations. For sure. Oh, I got a list. Let's talk after. All right. <laughs> um, but no, seriously, we, we have worked with a multitude of both high school and collegiate level um, institutions in the region. Um, I'll just use one as an example. Um, Hawken had a set of students at their school this year who created a website um, around voting in Cleveland. Um, and they also set up a platform to do text reminders, uh, letting you know about important dates. Um, you know, when we went from the primary to the general election, they sent information out, say these are the two candidates that are moving on. Um, and, and I believe all, if, if not most, of the students are under the age of 18. Um, so the things that they put together when they presented in their class to us, uh, Jen, and <laughs> Jen and I were sitting there like, like we need to hire these kids, right? So one, internships, right, for real, for real. Like we need more people <laughs> for sure helping and supporting. Um, so really being proactive. Uh, there's uh, literally in this room, you could probably secure an internship for this summer coming up in 2022. Um, there is definitely a need, right, for real. If you want to raise your hand, holler at Aiden. Um, <laughs> there is definitely a need for just innovativeness, right? Because, you know, we're sort of jokingly and flippantly talking about the 1900s and the 2000s, but the reality is in 20 years, hopefully I'm sitting on someone's beach, chilled out, relaxing, right? <laughs> Um, so I want to absorb, right? You want to absorb what I bring, my gifts are, and I want to absorb what energy and new ideas that you have at the same time. Um, Devante interned with myself, Evelyn, and Mordecai in the summer of 2017 when he was a, a rising senior. A year later when he graduated, we hired him. Why? Because he was by far the best intern I ever had. And, and now is one of my most revered, respected colleagues that I get to work with every single day. So there are many ways, you know, I think really just understanding your fabric, right? If you are living in Lakewood, I spent a lot of time living in Lakewood when I moved here, you know, just understanding what's happening, right? And what are ways that even you can empower your parents and your family, right? Sometimes it's just as simple as like, hey, ma, did you register to vote? Did you update, <laughs> you know, your voter registration? But there, are, I think, are more tactile ways, you know, having mock elections and mock conversations within your school, because uh, the reality is civics is not formally offered. Um, as uh, my husband is, uh, his licensure is in social studies. He elects to bring it in and has elected to bring it into his curriculum. Um, but I know that's not uniform across all, you know, all faculty and all curricula. So really thinking about how do you embed and think about how to bring this into your school and how you can ensure that not only giving yourself opportunities for future potential employment, but bring that innovative energy um, to existing efforts right now. Oh, Susan. <laughs> Hi. Um, COVID has had tremendous impact on us individually, collectively, in our work, in our relationships, all of those things. I'm wondering about the specific role of religious leaders 
as we move back into this new open era, what role might they play in, in the fact that they already have relationships with community and their membership and beyond? Um, what, what could they do individually or collectively that could really add to the dynamic interaction we have to um, increase voting and ensure democracy? Uh, I'm just wondering about their specific role, yeah. religious leaders. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing is that we have to understand we all have trusted messengers in our life, right? Whether that's a neighbor, a family member, a per, you know, a pastor or a faith-based leader. Um, so thinking about all the different trusted messengers we have, the strategies are going to look different, right? And I think understanding that for faith-based leaders specifically, in some ways, they already have a, a ready-made audience, right? They're parishioners uh, that are there. Um, we've seen examples just uh, just over the last couple of weeks, um, and, I, and forgive me if I say this church name wrong. I think it's the uh, Mount Zion um, East Baptist Church uh, that you know had videos, you know, t encouraging parishioners to participate and engage. They celebrated National Voter Voter, Voter Registration Day. A couple of years ago, we had um, South Euclid United Church of Christ, uh, who has amazing technological capabilities. Um, and at the time, the, the two volunteers um, uh, that we were working with, who were members of that church, came to us and said, you know, we want to do some stuff. We're part of this committee. What should we do? And we said, well, what are your assets, right? Let's start going through what you have and what you can offer. And when we learned about their social media following and um, the great technology that they had, we said, this is a great opportunity to start putting some, you know, informational videos together. So I think, you know, it's going to be different for each faith-based institution. I think the last year and a half has demonstrated to a lot of institutions that, wow, you know, maybe I didn't think I could do virtual service, <laughs> and now I can. Um, you know, sometimes it's as simple as having something on the banner, right? So if, if a faith-based institution is still holding virtual services, you know, if they have the technological capability, having just information, 443 vote at the bottom, you know, making a brief announcement before or after service I think is really important. Yourself uh, and what you're doing and have been doing uh, with the uh, Unitarian Universalist Church and holding the Sunday dialogues and the forums, I think, are equally as important. So again, I think it's customized to that uh, specific institution, and I think there's really some really great examples of folks stepping up. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm a freshman at the Cleveland State University, and I help with the campus vote projects, and I have to deal with like two kinds of people uh, when it comes to on-campus voter outreach. It's like the I don't care people and the I don't have time people. Do you have any advice for dealing with those kind of people? <laughs> your, your name is? Oh, I'm Jack Ryan. Jack? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, Jack, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the I don't care people, we all have heard this, right? Um, often, and, and there are folks that are far more well-versed than me uh, who have really, really keen skills in engaging folks on the ground. Um, I tend not to even say voting when I approach somebody. Um, I think the first 30 seconds are really pivotal. Um, many of you know I've, I've been a lobbyist, and in lobbying, right, I can usually assess in the first 30 seconds, does this legislator want to hear the story or they want to hear the stat, right? And like, how am I going to approach whatever the issue is that we're working on? And I think for, for engaging folks in the community, it's sort of the same way, right? So there are some things that are to your advantage, right? Because you're at a place-based institution. You're at an educational institution. I'm sure you can right now rattle off five things that students at Cleveland State are complaining about, right? So you may approach a student and say, hey, you know, we're really frustrated that you know, the, the commons are not open until midnight, right? What can we do about that, right? And just start to try to get to know that individual and you know, sort of extrapolate out from what's happening at Cleveland State to maybe what's happening in the city of Cleveland or even just in the footprint of the school to start to get to know someone, right? Often it's really about connecting the dots, right? The, the translation of the ballot is not, doesn't come as easy for a lot of people, right? If I, as we go back to the research and we see that people were concerned about healthcare, they're concerned about education, on face value, I didn't see the word education on my ballot when I voted last week, right? On face value, I didn't see the word healthcare on my ballot. But understanding the role of the mayor, understanding the role of the council persons, understanding what issue 24 was going to do, 
that's part of that translation, which goes back to Jan's question, right? Like being able to have these translators and, and repository of information that people can access so that they can see themselves in the ballot. Because at the end of the day, we have, to, we have to connect to that ballot. We have to understand what it means to me and how does it impact my life. The time y'all are on, Euclid, uh, <laughs> right up the street from the Board of Elections. So you better tell people to sit down when they say they don't have time uh, <laughs> about that. <laughs> Uh, there is verbal access to get over to the Board of Election and being on campus, of course, you have access to computers uh, so you can print out your vote by mail application. Um, but really, I think it's the personal customization in that conversation. I see, I see Dan coming up. Today at the City Club, we've been enjoying a forum featuring Erica Anthony. It's part of our Local Heroes series. It's presented in partnership with Citizens Bank and Dominion Energy, and today with the Cleveland Foundation as well. And we welcome guests at tables hosted by the Cleveland Foundation, Cuyahoga Community College, the Legal Aid Society of Greater Cleveland, the League of Women Voters of Greater Cleveland, Lakewood High School, Midtown Cleveland Incorporated, Ohio Environmental Council, Policy Matters Ohio, the Shar and Chuck Fowler Family Foundation, the George Gunn Foundation, Third Space Action Lab, and Wycliffe High School. I don't know if we've ever had quite so many tables outside of like our state of the schools or something like that, but we're so happy to have all of you here. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Be sure to join us next Friday, November 19th, uh, for a forum in our criminal justice series. We will be hearing about the construction of the Cuyahoga County Justice Center, a construction project that is much more than just a building, but is, in fact, in some ways, the architecture of justice, or could be. Joining us is Karen Chin. She was part of the group of national consultants who assisted Cuyahoga County leadership in the first phase of the work. And Rachel DeSalle of Cleveland Documenters will be moderating that conversation. Tickets are still available. You can purchase them, learn more about that forum and other forums, and how to become a member or volunteer with the City Club at cityclub.org. That brings us to the end of our program today. Erica, thank you so much for being a part of it, for leading us today. Thank you, members and friends of the City Club. I'm Dan Walthrop. Our forum is now adjourned. Have a great weekend. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream Public Media are made possible by PNC and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.